The hundreds of granite boulders in the red desert sand, 400 kilometers north of Alice Springs in Central Australia, are known as the Devil's Marbles. For Australia's indigenous Kaidich and Waramangu people, with their deep spiritual relationship with the land, these granite boulders represent a dreamtime legend. The legends form the basis of their lore and culture. The Aboriginal people, whose presence on this ancient continent goes back beyond 40,000 years, are part of Australia's soul, its mystique, its spiritual force. In the 1950s, a Christian missionary removed one of these sacred stones. I objected to people who said that I stole the stone because, um, I mean, that was said by some people and said it with a, with a feeling of um, condemnation, you know, that I'd, I'd uh, stolen the stone. That was never true <laughs> because uh, that stone was selected with love and with a, uh, a religious sentiment. And we blessed that stone, and you don't, you don't do that with things you steal. The story begins in the early part of the 20th century with the colonization of outback Australia by white settlers. As settlement expanded, Aboriginal people were forced from their land and were driven onto church or state-run missions. They were dispossessed. Although the outback was home, abuse and prejudice were common. As more Europeans arrived, the churches saw a new role providing pastoral care and basic services to the white pioneers. In 1912, John Flynn, a 32-year-old Presbyterian minister, was asked by his church to conduct a fact-finding tour of Outback Australia. John Flynn, with the support of his wife Jean, became superintendent of the Australian Inland Mission, today known as Frontier Services. Soon to be known affectionately as Flynn of the Inland, John Flynn served the people of his beloved outback for the next 39 years. Flynn established what he called a mantle of safety and brought communication to the outback through a network of pedal radios developed by his friend Alfred Traeger. Central to Flynn's vision was the foundation of the Flying Doctor Service. I had just graduated and they sent me to Southport in Queensland because I was a keen lifesaver. I joined the club there. He turned up by train. I knew he was coming because he was doing deputation work all around the country for the Flying Doctor Service. Well, he turned up and on the Sunday, I took him in an old Ford, <laughs> Ford A model and he took three services and came back. And then I said, well, the next day is my day at the, at the beach. I have to be there for you know, life-saving uh, duties. And he said, I'll come with you. And he came. He was fully dressed up with the Stetson hat and his, you know, his watch on his waistcoat. And um, he sat on the beach, fully dressed. When I was finished, I came and sat beside him and he started to yarn and he's the best yarn teller that I've ever met, really. 
And he lived his yarns and he made them slow and deliberate. And he said that we have to build a hospital in Birdsville. And he said, I'm looking for a young bloke who's a, who's a game enough to go to Birdsville. And uh, at that point, he didn't say a great deal more. Uh, I was uh, playing with the sand in the, on the beach. I love, I love the beach sand. And uh, he did the same. He started to let it run through his fingers. And he said, Fred, the sand out at Birdsville is a lot lovelier than this. And it was that sort of cryptic comment, you know, that, that he would twinkle in his eye. And he wouldn't say, you know, I want you out there. But he was implying it by his look, his twinkle, and talking about the sand out at Birdsville. When we got up to go to the dressing shed, he walked ahead of me. He was, uh, you know, five feet ten and a half, stooping shoulders, long strides, spectacles, and he just walked on. And I walked behind him, and I tried to put my jo jolly footsteps in the marks he was making. And uh, I often say, from that moment, my steps were in his footsteps all my life. That's the way it happened. Two months after their meeting at Southport, Mackay abandoned his plans for studying in Edinburgh for a swag, a tucker box, and a pedal radio. And I had the extreme privilege of working with and beside John Flynn for six years. We camped together, we talked together. We were just part of one another in, in the work in the field. Flynn and Mackay worked together to create new services for the people of inland Australia. New frontiers opened up, and with them, a demand for hospitals, nursing homes and clinics. The flying doctor service expanded so that once isolated homesteads were now just a radio call away from help. A great incident of a race meeting, John Flynn said, you go to all the race meetings because that's where the people are, that's their community. And uh, at that race meeting, a, a stockman was uh, thrown from his horse at the finishing line and two other horses fell over him and he was badly injured. And uh, I had my pedal radio and I called up the flying doctor and we waited for the flying doctor to land on the eight furlong track. And I'll never forget the doctor jumping out of the aircraft, running straight to this fellow in the, uh, in the dirt. We'd covered him with some branches. And I watched this whole drama. He had his brains were poking out, and I, he was poking back the brains and patting them on again. That fellow should have died, but he got him in the plane and was gone. And two old bushmen, two old codgers of the bush, they were standing beside me. And uh, um, the plane, two o'clock in the afternoon, flew over where we were standing and made the shadow of a cross at our feet, you know, as, as it flew off. And the, the, the old bloke nearest to me, he pointed up into the, into the sky and he said, that bloke is the flying Christ. I'd never heard a, an expression so vehement and so real. And that was the way Flynn worked. I mean, when you can't preach to people, do something that makes them ask, why are you doing it? That was so vibrant, so powerful for me that day that I said I'll give my life to the Flying Doctor and I stayed there for 34 years. <laughs> In 1939, Australia was at war. Mackay was determined to join the war effort. I want to be a pilot <laughs> and he said, uh, and he was the moderator general and he had to release me, but he wouldn't release me. But the next year he said, I'll let you go as a padre. And I went to Middle East as a padre.
Fred Mackay enlisted in 1940, and from 1942 until the end of the war served in the Middle East. I was now back in Brisbane at the time of Flynn's great frailty. And uh, he, he had met me immediately I returned from the war and wanted me to go straight back. And I said, look, I've been away from home for four years. I want to have some kids. <laughs> I want to have some home life. His last visit to our home, we walked to the botanical gardens together and sat there talking for hours. And uh, he said, I'd like to see you nominated as my successor. I said, I'll be your assistant and help. Well, it didn't turn out that way. He collapsed a few weeks later in church at, uh, at, uh, in a suburban a sub a suburb of Sydney. And, uh, in the hospital, died. In 1951, Fred Mackay was appointed as Flynn's successor and returned immediately to Alice Springs. He then began to plan Flynn's burial. It was John Flynn's wife, Jean, who first thought of the idea of covering her husband's grave with a large stone. She uh, recited the incident of the stone being placed across Christ's grave. And she gave us this concept of having a grave that you could put a stone over the ashes. <laughs> D.D. Smith uh, was there and he said, well, why don't we get a devil's marble? That, that, that's the, those are the best stones in this country and there are hundreds of them up in their town of Greek. You know why, why they call the devil's marble? We're not quite happy that the European say that devil's marble. Call him Kalogolu, not devil's marble. Kalogolu. In 1952, Fred Mackay went to Darwin and spoke with Frank Wise, the Commonwealth Government Administrator in the Northern Territory. He was seeking permission to remove a devil's marble. And I talked with him and he said, well, if D.D. D. Smith said a devil's marble would be a good thing, I give you permission to take one. And he gave it to me in writing later because I wanted to document it later. And he said, in the name of the Queen, I'll give you permission to take a stone to be put on Finn's grave. Getting the stone was a, a very simple exercise. Jack Reynolds was our welfare officer in Ten Creek and Skipper Partridge, the Reverend Kingsley Partridge, he and Jack Reynolds and I went to the Devil's Marbles together. And we wandered up and down because there are hundreds of them. In the end, we found the stone we wanted. From that moment, that rock assumed in my life a sort of a, a, a spiritual entity. It just wasn't an ordinary rock. I felt it very strongly that we were guided to the rock and that um, it wasn't just an accident that uh, this rock uh, entered the whole drama. A sacred stone was taken and the consequences would reverberate for decades to come. Mm. Mm. Her father was the guardian of this area. He used to come and check on all the rocks because some rocks do have special names. And that one up there, that big one, mm. we call it Wigirigi, that big one up there. In I believe it was placed there in the dream time so it can be shared by everybody. Tampoco 
She says the rock came there in a form of a person in the first place, and that's why they felt very bad before it turned into a rock. And when it turned into a rock, that is why they felt very bad and sad about the rock being taken away. The Devil's Marble was offloaded on the banks of Chinaman Creek in Alice Springs, where it remained for the next nine months. If there had been any questions raised about its cultural importance during that time, we, we, we would have sent it back again. John Flynn had made it known that he wanted to be buried beneath the ghost gums at Mount Gillen near Alice Springs. The site was surveyed and a plinth built to hold Flynn's ashes. Three cranes struggled to lift the eight-ton devil's marble onto the plinth. We uh, threw our hats in the air because of the, we got the devil's marble in position and Mrs Flynn said, thank God, you know, Jack's ashes are now being looked after by a devil's marble. She was very thrilled. Fred Mackay continued his work in Alice Springs, developing St Philip's College and the Old Timers Retirement Home. He was also the driving force behind the building of the John Flynn Memorial Church. The church, known as the Inland Cathedral, was opened in 1956 by the Governor-General Sir William Slim. The guest of honour was Fred Mackay's close friend, Prime Minister Robert Menzies. Menzies was a staunch admirer of Flynn's work and had laid the foundation stone for the church two years earlier. I used to be away in all parts of Australia, but I always came back to the Alice and I never failed to go out to the grave all by myself. And I would spend about a half an hour there uh, and in memory, recollecting what I owed to John Flynn, my old boss. And that grave to me became a sacred site. And I mentioned that to people and they said that we accept it as a sacred site too. So in the minds of several people who had, uh, you know, the eyes to see and the ears to hear, <laughs> it became a very, very spiritual spot of Australia. Over the years, Flynn's grave became a place of pilgrimage for thousands of Australians as they paid their respects to Flynn of the Inland. After 22 years, I retired then, and Max Griffiths, uh, I selected him to be my successor. And it was he, in 1974, that heard the first rumours of there being some dissatisfaction. The Kaitich and Waramangu people the traditional owners of the Devil's Marbles demanded that the stone be returned. The struggle for its return would last for a quarter of a century. Really fought me. Aboriginal never quite happy. It's a really fought me. There's Aboriginals and there's this culture. My father used to be telling me, do this, what mean <coughs> what I'm speaking. But my father passed away. I take off. This rock is a magic one. War Moana with this rock. Kadish Warner, this rock. Walbury, same. It's a Warner. It's a Portman, this rock come back. I had no idea about the Kaichi tribe or the other tribes around Tennant Creek because there's no way you could contact them easily. I mean, they had no real, you know, meeting places. And I didn't think of uh, going to Aboriginal. Quite frankly, I had no concept of the Devil's Marbles 
being culturally important to the Aboriginal people. For the last 25 years, the traditional owner's claim for the return of the stone to Kalu Kalu had been ignored. By the 1990s, attitudes in Australia were beginning to change. The land rights movement, the Sacred Sites Act, the historic High Court Mabo decision legitimising Aboriginal land rights claims, and the movement for reconciliation had begun to acknowledge the rights of Australia's indigenous people. The traditional owners of Kalu Kalu were finally being listened to. In 1996, the late Jonathan Rodd, a lawyer with the Central Land Council, made a plea on behalf of the traditional owners for the Devil's Marble to be returned. It was the lawyer, the legal man, who presented the views and the demands of the KHP, and he did it so well because he was well versed in their mythology and their whole culture. And uh, it was on the grounds of custodianship that he made his, his great claim. At the meeting, Mackay presented a statement about the grave, explaining its Christian significance, its consecration and its symbolism. I would dare to believe that it was a greater sacred site for me than this for the Aboriginal people. Now, that's because of the whole experience behind it. When controversy arose, it was an occasion of grief for me that it should enter the field of, uh, of argument because it's so contrary to Flynn's whole character. He believed in one family of people out in the bush, Aboriginals and whites. But it was the traditional owners and their prior claim to an ancient spiritual relationship who won the day. The sacred stone was to be returned. So I was facing up to a realistic uh, fact of their dream time. And they could say that, you know, they were custodians of the stone millions of years before Christ was born. And uh, there's no argument against it because that claim is true and right. I think there is no doubt that the, the work that John Flynn established in the medical work that uh, came to the Flying Doctor through, through to the work of the Flying Doctor has uh, done a great deal of good for Aboriginal people and we've heard Aboriginal people acknowledge that. But I think that we need to remember, and it's very clear when you read Flynn's 1912 report to the Presbyterian uh, Assembly, that he came into the centre of Australia mainly to serve the non-Aboriginal people of the centre, the, the white pioneers in inverted commas. And those of us who honour Flynn and recognise the tremendous good that was done by the Australian Indian Mission and the Royal Flying Doctors Service cannot avoid the reality that in its historical context both the work of the Australian Inland Mission and the Royal Flying Doctor Service did serve to consolidate the invasion of Aboriginal lands in the centre of Australia. Australia-wide, voices were raised in protest. Was a great man's grave being desecrated? Was Aboriginal spirituality more important than Christian belief? Opinion was divided. This reaction was captured by ABC Radio. As far as I'm concerned, this was consecrated by a bishop of the church. It is a white man's sacred site, if you want to go that far. And moving it is desecrating it. I've had a great respect for the Aboriginal people. I've done tours throughout the Northern Territory for over 20 years. But from tomorrow on, the Aboriginal people will get no quarter from me. I piss on their sacred sites. And you may quote me on that. 
Fred Mackay had no illusions about the anger in some white quarters about the removal of the devil's marble. Fred Mackay used to talk about the kinds of people that he was keeping at bay, that, you know, there were people talking about bailing up the truck on the Stewart Highway as it took the stone north. Um, there are others who I encountered myself that spoke of, uh, you know, if they were going to go ahead and move the stone, he'd be there on the day with a gun. In the midst of this divisiveness, the Aranda people of Alice Springs offered their own gesture of reconciliation by donating a stone from traditional Aranda land. The new rock to replace the Devil's Marble was found on a registered sacred site near Alice Springs. We Aranda people were in police about it. <coughs> in the first time they put the rock here. We didn't know where it came from. We thought it was a rock from a local, a local hill, but it turned out to be from different, different tribes. We are under people now very proud to, you know, keep this old rock back to them. And the replace of that under, I don't know so many rock, because it means more to us. That rock we can put here. We were out with the caterpillar at dream time. Dates were now set for the collection of the Aranda ceremony stone and the exchange with the devil's marble on John Flynn's grave. Yeah, I am a bit sad to move the rock from its uh, original site. And I know where the site was and it's like moving one's arm away from your body. When we removed the um, rock, in, like replacing the um, devil's marble and putting a rock there, um, it's like keeping one's part of the body away. So it's kind of sad too. Aranda people are offering to put things right in, in every possible way between the Kaiditch and Warramalu and the Aranda, between themselves and the church and between the church and the people that had had the stone removed from them in the first place. You've got to remember this is something that uh, wasn't necessarily, you know, uh, of the making of Aranda people, um, but uh, they went out of their way and done that. and. Uh, I think that that has got to be seen as, as a great act of reconciliation. In July 1999, the Aranda Stone was collected. The relocation of the stone was a solemn occasion. Although it was moving from one part of Aranda land to another, it was nevertheless a painful process for the traditional owners. The stone was transported to a stonemason to be prepared for the exchange. On the morning of Saturday, the 4th of September, 1999, the parties gathered for a press conference held at Adelaide House in Alice Springs. Well, welcome, everyone. It gives me great pleasure to be a, be a part of uh, this event here today. I think it's a fairly extraordinary event. It's the uh, culmination of a hell of a lot of hard work that's been put in by most of these people sitting here at the table today and quite a few other people working in the background. There's a lot of people the non-Aboriginal society, there are very little, if any, understanding whatsoever of the distress that's been caused to Aboriginal people and in particular custodians of the sites that we're here to try and change around today and put back in place 
and let the spirits go back to where they belong. The lives of the Kadich and Warramunga people and their spirits can be rendered whole again through the return of their stone back to their country and for the Arunda people of Central Australia, I think to stand proud to be able to go into an arrangement that they have. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Oxfam Community Aid Abroad funded the exchange of stones. Community Aid Abroad pays tribute to the Uniting Church of Australia and the former head of the Royal Flying Doctor Service, the Reverend Fred Mackay, who have acted with honesty and great dignity in recognising the mistakes of the past and addressing the concerns of the Waramungu and Gaidich people, the traditional owners, in actively supporting the return of their sacred rock. Our own political leaders could learn well from the wisdom of ordinary Australians here, both black and white, involved in this landmark event. There is no question, and it would be dishonest to say otherwise, that the decision to move the stone caused Fred deep feelings of honest grief. This is to be expected as Fred had had the responsibility of establishing the grave and the memorial to his old boss and friend, the Reverend John Flynn, one of Australia's greatest champions of all outback people. Fred has been deeply touched by the generosity of the local Arundel people who have given, in his words, a more excellent stone than ever to be mounted above Flynn's ashes. The stage was now set for the exchange that afternoon. When I spoke to David Alexander, I said, will we be embarrassed by the fact that uh, the Arendi people own the stone? He said, they don't want to own it. They're giving it. And this came out in Rosie's talk. We are giving the stone. We are losing something sacred, but we're honouring the name of John Flynn, who did so much for our people. And... Uh, that sort of sentiment was emerging, it was creeping through in all our dialogue and conversation. And this, this changed my, my attitude to, the, to the, the deal that we're making in exchanging stones. Among those witnessing the exchange were a few townsfolk who wished the whole project would fail. But generally, the mood was positive there was a sense that an historic act of reconciliation was in progress. The taking of the devil's marble was compared with the plight of members of the stolen generations. Removing the stone was similar to taking Aboriginal children away from their parents. Like, like I said, when you take children away, and you, you grow up and you realise you the son and daughter, and his son and daughter might have children again, and this poor boy might be with a walk and stick. Now you don't know where you come from. You don't know where his mother, you don't know where his grandfather. You don't know. He just, and he don't know the culture. So this is going back to Devil Marvel. And I'd like to, I'd like to thank you all for this uh, greetings today. Uh, thank you very much. After 46 years, the Devil's Marble was removed to be replaced with an Arundel stone. Among those present to witness the exchange of stones was Fred Baird, John and Jean Flynn's nephew.
Finally, the Devil's Marble began its long journey home, traveling 400 kilometers north up the Stuart Highway to the traditional lands of the Kaiditch and Waramangu people. The handback ceremony was a belated opportunity to apologize. The church is so sorry that what was done so long ago caused so much pain. And we are so happy now that your voice has been heard and that which is yours has been returned to where it belongs. The Kaidich and Waramangu people celebrated the return of the stone to Kalu Kalu with ceremony and song. Although the process had at times been painful, the journey towards mutual understanding was clearly an act of reconciliation. The returned marble bears the scars of its time away. The rock was stripped of its original colour when it was sandblasted in the 1970s after vandals graffitied Flynn's grave. In the year 2000, Fred Mackay died. He was 92. His change of heart was a courageous act of reconciliation. to express what, what reconciliation is, that was reconciliation in the flesh. It was an act. It was dinky die reconciliation. one 
message to avow what's been done. Regret and shame, the torment of past, leave a legacy. Will never again abandon the stolen child. Open heart lights up.